I feel like we talked training about training for uh, last time. I'm doing the monumental this year. The full or the half? The full. Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. I did that. All right. Let's talk about that. You, you ever guys. done a full marathon before? Uh, on, on Halloween. It was my COVID hobby. So I, I did my first one on Halloween last year. Your first full marathon? Yeah. On Halloween? Yeah. In a costume? Was, no. Well, I wore those. Um, they're running shorts, but they have denim print on them, so they look like jorts. <laughs> That's but awesome. that's normal for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> no one and a Fu Manchu, but and and tape on your nips. Yeah, unfortunately, like as I picked it up, the shorts I pay way too much for shoes. The shorts get increasingly shorter, and I don't run out of band aids for the nips. If you put deodorant on, it actually helps a ton. I do that, and and on my inner thighs for yeah. some glide. <laughs> Yeah, feet helps with blisters. I haven't haven't feet. had that problem yet, but it's. Yeah. I have a better solution. <laughs> That's don't, right. don't run a full marathon. <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, so the one we did in on Halloween, my brother in law put together, and they had an official company come out, timing company come out, and someone actually measured the course. So it was it was a Boston how, qualifier. How many how many people participated? Um, let's just say I finished top 10. So that's a lonely ass race. So there were 12 people. In there, I beat there. one person. <laughs> <laughs> I ran like it was, I ran a really good race. Just the people who, the club who set it up, they're, they're legit. Like they're yeah. sub three hour type people. And so I was thrilled with my time and in, in doing it. It just, I was there running a different against the Kenyans. class. Yeah. Actually there were like two hours. But, right? and that's why I signed up for monumental. Cause I wanted to do like, a, that one was real, but I wanted to do a big city one yeah, and have a crowd. This I one mean, had four loops just so they could have less water stations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they didn't have a hundred volunteers, right? They had like four. Yeah. Oh, how many? So how many? Ten people? Yeah. So 10 people did the marathon and there was 15 people who they did a half marathon. Oh God, that's a lonely ass race course. Yeah. But with four loops, you got to. So did you get lapped? Still. I did not. Okay. <laughs> that was that was my fear that On the they were good one. enough or it would have it would have been close had I ran a little bit slower. Right. <laughs> oh. When's the monumental? Is it early November? The first week first, of November. Yeah, November. Okay. So you'll be flying through our hood. Yeah. Uh I'll make sure I'm out there with the Bloody Mary and some donuts okay. and, and just kinda wave yep. as you go by. I'll order my uh <laughs> my uh heroes socks. Oh yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'm trying to get a new tank kit but i'm just hoping someone has it like in a box somewhere that mm. or because i imagine there's a minimum order quantity they're yeah. pretty legit looking i did the full monumental a few years ago and it goes right past my house right yeah i and didn't know up, if it went off delaware or penn it or, goes yeah. up washington okay i mean it kind of cuts through um and past my house is about a mile 11 um, and it took every fiber of my being not to turn right up my driveway, <laughs> hop up the steps in the door and, and straight to my couch. That's awesome. We, uh, I did a half in Zionsville and at the eight mile mark, it, uh, cut right by my house. And at the time, the most I had ran was nine miles and the hottest it had gotten, it was like 60. So the, when I ran, it was 88 out oh. and yeah, that's miserable. I like did the jog walk in. Yeah, from there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's miserable. awesome. Uh, what Joe failed to mention though was as soon as he was done, showered, changed, and within, I'm gonna say an hour, picked him up and drove to Milwaukee. <laughs> he, he just like laid in the back. It was a little crampy. <laughs> a little cramped up. Well, you're not allowed to get out of your chair mid recording. I work the clock's on, but you're on the clock. I was thirsty. I guess, I guess that's the end of our, our cold open. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and make sure you uh, <laughs> hit that notification bell. Roll the Alrighty, well, welcome to Thank the Industrious you. Podcast. 
Today's guest, Mr. Michael Sullivan, not very Irish sounding at all. No. From Superior Industrial Solutions. Like that, I, I recalled the uh, the new name. Yeah, we uh, made a recent change. Uh, yeah, less than a year ago, so we're still trying to get used to it. Yeah, well, it's we- shorter than it was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to. Uh, when people call and say, "What's your best price on oil?" We don't have to say we don't have that. And then they say, "Isn't your name Superior Oil?" And we say, "Yeah, <laughs> about that." So we were founded 1932 Superior Oil. Home heating fuels was our gig for a long time, so the timing was right. And, you know, I think the only thing that made us hold off a long time was that website name, the URL, and and figuring out what that was going to be. So there, there aren't the that many left. What was the old URL? Was it still Superior Oil? SuperiorOil.com. Okay. So, you know, Superior was gone. Yeah. Uh, anything you wanted was gone, and you kind of learn about – who's hosting all these and how much money they want for their, oh, yeah. their site. Right. Yeah. Uh, what was the main driver for the, the branding change? I think to get oil out of it, it yeah. just isn't associated to us anymore. We don't market it. We're not trying to go in the oil world and uh, solutions had that double meaning. We you know we do a lot of liquid solvents and chemicals and our whole gig and distribution is finding that niche and just trying to answer. Oh, wait, uh, wait, I get wait. it. That double meaning solutions like, like excessa like yeah. answers, <laughs> but also the soluble yes, things. Yeah. Wow. Tricky. Do we get royalty for that? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Absolutely. <laughs> well, why don't you, uh, educate and or introduce our viewers to who Mike Sullivan is, if you would a little background history. Sure. I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. So I was a, You're it's actually called work. Granger, but I say South Bend It's the closest big city. Uh, grew up a Notre Dame fan. That's pretty much all that's around there and played soccer my whole life. So I ended up in IUPUI on a soccer scholarship. I figured. Which high school did you go to again? Penn High School. Penn, okay. So go to IUPUI and I figure, you know, at that point in my life, I still wanted to play soccer, but you don't know once you go to the next level, I, I could, maybe I suck. I don't know, maybe this doesn't work out the way I I hope, and I just wanted to make sure all my credits transferred to either IU or Purdue. Um, but really enjoyed it. Met a lot of great friends there. Enjoyed the classes I was taking. Majored in marketing and distribution management. Um, again, I was just trying to pad my resume with a double major. I didn't know if I'd ever go into distribution, but my first job out of college was with a company called GE Supply. I was inside okay. sales, customer service, selling OEM GE electrical parts. Mm-hmm. And then the opportunity to work for Superior came along, and I got to start as a sales trainee, which was nice for me because I always thought I wanted to go into sales, but I was also scared that I either would hate it or not be very good at it. And early on, I kept thinking, what is sales? Am I selling ads out of the yellow book? Am I, you know, going door to door selling Cutco knives <laughs> or what, you know, I don't know, but Those are good knives, by the way, they, they are. <laughs> I, uh, we need some new ones desperately. <laughs> if you're out there, Cutco people, there you go. <laughs> your phone's going to ring <laughs> nonstop now. Yeah. <laughs> Why are all these college kids at my door? Pages and Cutco. Uh, so I had an opportunity to crawl before I walked and had a, I was a trainee. So I did a lot of, uh, you know, work on the inside, understanding superior from start to finish in the process of an order. So I'd spend a lot of time in customer service, Mm -hmm. um, in operations, blending, filling drums with drivers, filling a lot of pails, sweeping. Uh, and then, uh, there was an opportunity to get a small territory you know, at the time it was a really big deal for me. Um, but looking back on it, I could have probably lost every single account and we would have been okay. Um, (laughs) that's a good thought. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But I, you know, cut my teeth on a territory in Southeast Indiana and did that for about a year and a half. My, were you living out of Indy at that time? Yeah. So I was in the broad ripple area, Mm -hmm. um, at that time and, uh, got the sales manager job way quicker than I probably should have, but it, you know, I got thrown into the fire in that pretty early and had an opportunity to lead the sales team out of Indianapolis, um, was general manager of the Indianapolis branch for a little bit. And now I'm a 
regional sales manager. So I cover sales for Indianapolis, Elkhart, uh, St. Louis, and Springfield, Missouri. And so now I'm in a position where I'm in a sales support role. It's a, uh, all right, what do we need to do to grow the business and focus on the things that, that we're good at? Yeah. And Which so, are? uh, yeah. <laughs> Solutions. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what primary product lines is your group cover? Yeah. So superiors split into three different disciplines. We have our solvents, uh, chemicals, composites, and recycling. Solvents and chemicals uh, is give or take, you know, 75% of the business, a, l- a larger chunk. Composites is a big discipline for us. Um, you know, that's an area where we sell everything you have to buy if you live in that world from fiberglass, resins, gel coat, catalyst, mold release, um, adhesives. So we have a lot to offer uh, in that industry. And then the recycling, we have a plant in Connersville, Indiana, where we recycle hazardous waste. And so a lot of paint and coating companies, applied paint and coating companies can send us, or large printers can send us their waste. We can recycle it. It's almost like a mini distillation column and send it back to them for them to use. So it has some, you know, good economics if it works out and there's some sustainability, um, you know, help that we get, you know, by helping them go green or reduce their carbon footprint. So when you say it has waste, are you talking about all excess paint or are you talking more on the solvent and chemical side and then putting that through the distiller to pull out what you can. Right. And it, then... It'd be mostly on the solvent and chemical side. So yeah. if they're purging a line where this waste still has some some really good solvency in it, um, you know, we're going to take away the still bottoms or the resins, the polymers left behind, and then give them back that cleanup solvent or purge solvent that they're, they're cleaning up. So, you know, we get it. It might be comprised of 50 different colors, yeah. but there's some really good um, material um, yeah, left you can in pull the out of that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the current state of affairs. Sure. Um, I can think of at least the two primary areas of your guys' business is nothing short of crazy right now. Um, and I know, obviously, through the products that we buy from you guys, um, what's your pulse of everything? If you, if there even is a pulse? Yeah, there's. It's been a very challenging, you know, we feel like we've been working twice as hard for half the available product. Mm -hmm. So we've heard a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of new terms being tossed around um, because of the allocation. So not all of them, but there are more than half or are on some sort of allocation. So you think every order that comes through, you have to decide, is it, coming in on time is, you know, we're scrutinizing every order to make sure the people, you know, who've been loyal and have that history are getting the right product that we don't give too much too early and not have any at the end of the month. Um, but there's been more force majeures than I've ever seen in my life. There's some that are on, you know, soft allocation. There are some based off of a strict allocation where, when we get that list, we're pulling up all the history and it, a lot of ours is set on the previous six months. Mm-hmm. So we look at that window. And again, that previous six months was probably set before winter storm Yuri back in middle of February. So we're still benchmarking off of that allocation. That's been, um, you know, it's the middle of August now and we're still riding that damn Yuri guy. Yeah. And uh, pr- prior to this, Vince asked, how long are we going to blame all this on, on Yuri? And I don't know. We probably, maybe for five more months is my guess. <laughs> yeah. So it's tough. It's, yeah, it's. Because it's, when you get, I mean, when you guys are getting the allocation notices, whatnot, there's no timeline. It's just. Right. Here it is. Correct. We'll, we'll let you know when it changes. Correct. Yeah, until there's some normalization or stability, which no one has that crystal ball. Yeah, and every now and again, you could beg a few more pounds out of the supplier, given the situation. But, you know, are we, you know, and they're doing the same thing, right? They have so many pounds to give out. Are you going to give it to the someone making pet shampoos or who's about to, 
manufacture the COVID vaccine, right? There's just been varying degrees of, you know, who's shutting down and how important is the finished product that they're making. Right. There's actually a word to describe this phenomenon. It, it came out of one of the top business graduate schools uh, in the in the U.S. Um, and it's called babysitting. Yeah. Because that's kind of what this whole process is. You're babysitting your purchase orders going into your suppliers. You're babysitting the incoming orders. You're babies, you know, the incoming, uh, the receiving orders from your suppliers. You're babysitting the incoming orders from your customers to make sure that they're taking a normal amount, that they're not hoarding anything. And then you're babysitting the process back out. And then when you're done, you realize, huh, I don't have any material left. And you, it, in a cycle, right. just repeats itself. Yes. Yeah, it's, the, uh, I can't imagine what the new cost of processing an order is. You know, we've looked at those things before in an effort to say is, you know, those questions that come through all the time, is this worth it? And now it's had to have more than doubled, I would expect. Um, yeah. A lot of that's rooted on transportation too. So yeah. not only are we issued with these allocations where we have to control and make sure the right people are getting these pounds, but uh, transportation is so unbelievably unreliable that right. we're almost, you know, hey, the truck didn't show up. We're almost callous to that now. Like, okay. Hey, right, well, when it does, let me yeah, know. Yeah, it's just yeah. typical yeah. Friday. A yeah. Year, a couple of years ago, you'd say, hey, why isn't the truck here? Yeah, no or hey, now I need a corrective action. What's going on? What are you going to do to prevent this? And now it's like, I don't want that mark on us. I want them to want to deliver to our facility. Um, you, you can't be picky, unfortunately. Uh, just actually, if you want, you can tell the drivers you have Chick-fil-A waiting for them. Like, Bribery goes a long I way. I think we should, yeah, we could up our um, driver's room for sure. To, <laughs> you have a driver's room? For our own. Is it like a green like, room? No, it's nothing special, but we need to, it's something we could, you know, we need to get better at that and make people want to come. Right. I do all wear snazzy blue golf pants. I like those. Those are pretty fly. For those <laughs> that didn't know, Mike's nickname is also Blue. We'll save that for a different podcast. Yep. So <laughs> being that you are in the sales discipline and that we, any really it's our industry in particular, but a lot of industries ac and across a lot of you know, a very wide ranging spectrum are dealing with supply issues. And we've talked about this sort of ad nauseum in, right. in prior episodes because it's it's the biggest gray cloud hanging over uh, a lot of businesses and sort of broader economy right now. Sure. Um, you're in sales and you're trying to to mitigate existing business, the, the, the effect that not having a lot of product to sell them has. How do you balance that with still wanting to go out and grow market share, bring on new customers? Are you actively seeking out new business or are you sort of, What's, what's the company stance and what's your strategy been there? I think early on it was the comfort zone was to just keep what you have. I think a lot of people were, were reluctant to change because they're scared to jump ship or switch and lose all that, you know, that allocation that they had worked so hard for. So it was tough to get people to switch on the commodity world. But um, I wouldn't say we've doubled down. You know, we're leaving every rep has the autonomy to go and go in there and, and you know, you have COVID things going on and find out what the true opportunity is, but we've pushed them to go after it and get new business. And then we'll go back and evaluate whether we can support that or not. But I think people are more willing to talk now than we've ever seen. And there are opportunities to help them mitigate risk or maybe, Hey, maybe you should try a different product and get the conversation away from price. Um, that part's never been easier in my sales career. So, out of the gate, I think there was some reluctance to go out there and, you know, sell and, and promote new, but we've tried to not let that be an excuse because people are open to discussions and talking about it. They have more questions than they've ever had. And if it's put us in a position to help them either reformulate or come up with something different or, you know, in my first 13 years at Superior, if I said security of supply, nine out of 10 folks, it, it, you know, fell on deaf ears. They didn't, that didn't mean anything to them because they probably hadn't been through a situation where they were, they were stuck. Um, now it does. So if we're on the outside looking in, 
they're looking to yeah. mitigate risk and have more than one supplier. But it, on the, like you said, if we're the incumbent, we're trying to make sure we're the right fit for them um, no matter what. So we've, I, I could see how you would want to just protect what you have and, and go into maintenance mode, but we've really tried to push everybody to um, help people in, in hopes that when we come out of this and have supply, we'll be ahead of the others. How many people have you, or how many customers, or I mean, I should say prospects have come to you um, shopping already? And we had a situation yes. this week where um, someone who doesn't buy from us currently buys from a competitor, competitor can't supply them. They came to us with, with a request and so we said, okay, well, yeah, we, we have the product price is X. They're like, Ooh, that's a fair amount higher than I'm paying now. And you're like, well, I, it is what it is. Like we're getting the same increases and just like that, boom, PO, I'll take right. whatever I can get. Uh, that's now, I, we may not hold on to them when things normalize and their, their current supplier gets a product yeah. they may go right back. I don't know. hope not, but we'll wait and see. We've been in a similar position position on several products that we're okay um, adding volume to um, and it happens it's happened quite a bit and you know the trick is it, same for you guys I don't want just that order you know and I don't want to be in a position to just bail you out right you know I want to I want to take our relationship to the next level and you know have sustainable business I want to be able to support you when things are okay too. Sure. So yeah, we'll take the order um, if it makes sense, but we're really trying to just make sure it's sustainable and anyone new we're adding on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. It You have to balance the, hey, if this sort of fell out of the sky into my lap, is it worth, is it worth taking? I mean, you, and there's a lot of background that went into that. How does this impact my supply for existing business? Is the one it's is it the one time deal? Is it worth it? You know, how does that build a relationship? Right. Yeah, we want to be good for both parties, obviously. And but yes, we you know, we have a lot of new best friends calling mm -hmm. and some of the uh rookie reps get really excited when you have to kind of break it to them that it's probably not going to happen. And that's tough. You want to give people yeah. wins, right? Right. And you wanna help someone in need out, but product dependent, we, sometimes we can help. And, um, it seems like there's a lot of them that we haven't been able to sure. Um, in an effort to protect our, our customer base. Right. Halfway through the third quarter, any change in strategy for the remainder of the year and, and maybe not just for the fourth, but for the first quarter of next year as well, or to just stay the course balancing out all the crap that's going on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes. D, all the above. Stay the course. Uh, yeah. I just still, uh, I don't want it, anyone, you know, the sales force to get complacent. Uh, I think we're still going to push to, you know, pick up the phone, call people if they're, if they're not meeting with them live or that's happening a lot less then people are still, people still need a lot of help out there. Right. So. I may get back to you and change my mind, but right now it's uh, approach forward. That seems to be state of the course, right? Here's yes. my answer right now, but I may be back to you in 10 minutes and it'll make yeah. it completely change. Right. <laughs> yeah, that crystal ball it just continues to get cloudier and uh -huh. cloudier. Right. Anything different on the composite side from the solvent chemical side? Uh, similar story. You know, the domestic manufacturers or resins are having the same problems. Um, I'm sure a lot of the mm -hmm. paint companies are having, uh, we import a lot of fiberglass. So that brings on a whole nother slew of issues. So we deal with, you know, we kind of touched on domestic transportation. So then the freight costs sky. Yeah. So I was, I was looking at it as I was preparing for this, uh, let's say a full container of chemicals, uh, over a year ago, probably cost, you know, let's say a 40,000 pound net uh, container, maybe around 10 cents a pound. Right now, that's around 50 cents a pound. Oh. So just for the 
you know, to get it from Asia to, and oftentimes now that's not even to our f- superior facility, right? That might just be to one of the ports, to LA or wherever, at New Jersey, LA, and they say you you deal with it w- once it gets there. So, you know, we're talking a forty cent a pound increase in just freight on the uh, chemical side, which is a lot to stomach because if it some can, of that stuffs in less than a dollar a pound to begin with. Just for the chemical. Yeah, absolutely. Raw so if they're if it's also manufactured in North America, it's making it a lot less competitive and it takes twice as long to show up anyway for several reasons. Right. Um but those are all dangerous goods too on a lot of the chemical side. So they have their own uh added problems by just being a different class. But the fiberglass that we import from China's same thing that extended lead times, prices are increases, increasing for a variety of reasons. And I was listening to our international business manager yesterday, and she's saying, you know, okay, we're, we were talking about the Lunar New Year coming up in, in China, which is a big deal. They take two weeks off. Well, everyone wants to take a week off before that because they don't want to get COVID and miss out on the New Year. And then there's this little city in China that if you pass through it, you get, and, and forgive my ignorance, but you get like yellow carded, right? Saying, hey, Vince drove through this city. He needs to be in quarantine for 14 days. So if Vince is a driver, he's not going to drive through that city. And it's a city that's the quickest way to get to one of the ports. So it's making this congestion even a bigger deal. And those drivers leading up to that new year aren't, they're going to take even an extended break. So there's going to be a, they predict close to a month of very lackluster production. And so what I'm seeing in, in a lot of these import things is, what, you know, what does their crystal ball say? It says it's going to be bad and we'll reevaluate after the lunar new year's o- lunar new year is over. Or in other words, order up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what does that get do? if you want order now, so it comes in January. Yeah. What does that do though for domestic producers? Are there enough? Could they, I don't think they can keep supply? up. I don't think they can keep up with demand Okay. Um, for the domestic producers on that product line. So they're just, matching the price increases. Okay. Cause I would think, I mean, you've heard the conversations over the several last, however many years, if the uh, transport costs keep escalating, um, you may or may not have product issues. And obviously the time, which you can equate to money as well. At what point then do you just start buying domestically instead of importing in? Yeah. I, I've, Speaking from Superior on most others, I don't think we can because they don't have the capacity. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have a massive supply issue. Right. Yeah. So as an aside, speaking of yellow cards, was that your thing? I mean, how many, being a soccer player, like how many do you, were you the guy that picked up the yellow cards a lot? I did. I had a lot of yellow cards. I never, I never got a red card in my career. So good boy. Did you yeah. m- mainly get carded for like lack of playing the ball or for talking back to the I I was ref or? I uh I kept my mouth shut. I was always respectful. Um uh but it was just for a bad foul usually. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't bad, th- bad in someone else's eyes. Right. I was I it was all ball, but of course, potato potato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, Michael, we appreciate your guys' partnership and um, all the years that we've been buying products from you guys and, and look forward to uh, to many more. Thank you for the golf tees. Welcome. These will uh, these will be certainly used on September 30th, if not before. And coincidentally, what color is the ball marker? That's right. You got blue. it. Blue. Hey, my boy, blue. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this episode of the Industrious Podcast. Again, make sure you subscribe to the Assessa YouTube channel. Click on that notification bell to uh, be alerted when new episodes drop and be industrious.